Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Permaculture Living Land, Living Lands Trust, Resilient Design Strategies for Climate Change. My name is Alexander Warshall. I'm the Member Communications Coordinator for NOFA New York, and I'll be make sure I'm making sure everything goes smoothly for us today. With me, I have Ashley from NOFA New York on his technical support. Uh, if you have specific technical questions, feel free to ask her in the chat. And just as a reminder, please remain muted with your video off during presentations. We have enabled closed captioning. The captions are auto-generated and they're not perfect. Um, but if you'd like to see the captions, there should be a notification at the top of the screen and allowing you to do so. This workshop is being recorded and will be shared on the conference website and mobile app shortly after this presentation. Feel free to introduce yourself and ask questions during the chat. And Andrew has asked that if you could type in the questions in the chat, I will um, ask him as the presentation goes and we'll answer questions and answers in that fashion. NOFA New York's annual winter conference would not be possible without the support of all our generous sponsors. NOFA New York would like to specifically thank our app sponsors, Hudson Valley Farm Hub and Honey Dog Farm. To learn more about these organizations and their work, please visit them in our marketplace and online. Now I'd like to pass it off to Andrew, who will take it from here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Uh, appreciate everyone coming in. I wonder if folks could indulge me with a little bit of um, a little bit of, you know, maybe any thoughts you had of things that you'd like to learn that you came into this session uh, curious about. And I don't know if it's part of our protocols, but certainly it would be great if you can have your video on for a few to uh, to do that as we kick it off. Thank you. Yes, we can totally do that just to allow everyone if, uh, if you want to unmute and say what you'd like to learn about, feel free to do so. Yeah, I just I find it's a little bit awkward lecturing the black boxes. <laughs> So I'll go uh, first. Uh, thanks, Megan. Uh, my name is Megan Monteleon, and I live um, right outside of New York City, up in the burbs, uh, north of the city. Um, and I'm part of a women's organization for ecological sustainability and social justice that's in Cornwall, New York. And we have a big old house and a piece of land. And there are some members of my group who want to somehow convert it to a permaculture center mm. of some sort. Yeah. And I would like to find out more about um, what what you've done and see if there's things that seem applicable to our group. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Great to have you with us. Thank you, glad to be here. Anybody else? Laura, I saw you um, coming on for a minute. Um, Well, I can just dive right into it. Is, is, is it not possible? Alex, Alex, are people unable to turn on their, their video? Is that a setting that you guys are doing right now? or They are able. So um, they, have, they are able. Okay. They are able. Yep. And Andrew, Andrew, you just caught me going to get some tea. So sorry about that. Oh, yeah. No, no problem. I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm here because I'm always just interested to see how other people are thinking about resilience. Oh yeah, great. And thank you for coming to our listening sessions that David and I had. Appreciate your insights. Thanks. Good to have you here. Um, Magena, am I saying your name correctly? Awesome. I don't really have anything to share. <laughs> Just happy to uh, be here and listening. Great, thank you. No agenda, but thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Andrew, we have two from the chat. We have Julie saying, I'm interested, sorry, I'm interested in planting about a half an acre into a forest farm. I'm trying to learn how to map the area, account for wetter areas, etc. cetera. Hmm. And Danielle asks, or Danielle says, sorry, I can't video today. I'm from the Tyre County Water and Conservation District. Curious what the land has looked like that you are enrolling in this type of trust and if it can be, be applied to my county in any way. Mm, awesome, thank you. 
That's great. So we've got more folks in the waiting room too. You guys are on. Yep. Thank you. Anybody else want to share anything? Or just say hi, un, un, you know, black screen yourself. I can actually see your shining, happy human face. <laughs> Phil, thanks. Good to see you. All right. Um, oh, no worries. No, I understand. Video, a lot of, I know for a lot of people, especially if you're on a phone, it's challenging. So um, rather than, you know, as you get a chance throughout the the uh, presentation today or at the end, we'll, I'm going to leave a good solid 15 minutes for question and answer. So at that point, we can have sort of a, a roundhouse discussion and folks can um, un, 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 you know, if you can turn your video on, then that's great. And if not, no problem. But I will begin to dive into our presentation here. So my name is Andrew Faust. I have been teaching and applying permaculture in really heavily in the Northeastern United States for, um, well, since 1996, technically being certified in 1996 uh, by Peter Bain and Chuck Marsh, who started Earth Haven outside of uh, Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, Peter is the publisher and editor of the Permaculture Design Magazine. And my focus as a person in really the field of ecological literacy is the broader term that I like to use, which is um, speaking to the need to educate our society in understanding how evolution works, how the processes of time are so important when we're looking at landscapes, and to begin to appreciate the spectrum of change that we exert as a species on the planet has been something that I've been studying for most of my adult life and thinking about um, civilization and whether or not it is something that is cut out to live for much of a longevity, you know, how do we create a longer term human version of civilization? rather than what it seemed to me throughout most of my life is evident, which is that civilization uh, is at the lightest unsustainable and often uh, catastrophically exploitative and destructive. And so those things seem problematic to me as a citizen who is uh, enmeshed in this thing that is often referred to as civilization. So as an educator, I've been focused on this broad scale analysis, um, you know, long before popularized by say publishers and books like um, Jared Diamond's Collapse, uh, which is a relatively recent book on this, but, you know, going back to people like Toynbee and Herodotus in 400 BC, you know, Herodotus says the point of history, uh, the reason to refer to Herodotus is in the Western hemisphere. He's basically the first person who wrote a book that's called history. And in it, Herodotus says, this is in 400 BC, he says, the point of history is to learn from our mistakes. And so I like to start with that because oftentimes this term permaculture can feel perhaps obscure or um, esoteric or in some way not familiar to folks. Um, I'm just going to admit people, it seems like Hannah's sitting there. Okay. So, um, it's a sideline on logistics. So as we're as we're thinking about what permaculture, it really comes out of this questioning of the sustainability of civilization. In a sense, that's the core question of permaculture as a discipline. Bill Mullison and David Holmgren, who coined the term permaculture, it's a contraction of a term that predates it. And that term is permanent agriculture worth going into for this presentation is a big theme is going to be trees and how awesome they are and all the cool things we can do with them and how underutilized they are. Turns out it's an easy lift that permaculture has been leveraging for quite some time, which is just get people excited about trees. It's a good idea. 
it's a great place to start because you can overthink what it is that needs to be happening and how we bring about the change. However, I will add to that that I'll be elaborating on a lot of things that aren't so great that are happening around agroforestry with large scale monoculture and carbon credits and various things that aren't really going to end us up as a society, as a civilization with something that has much lasting power. So I've been teaching in New York City for 14 years. I lived off the grid for eight years in West Virginia and built my own homestead there under the principles of permaculture because I wanted to see how they worked in a remote site. So I built a straw bale house, gravity fed water, made my living selling vegetables to high-end restaurants in um, Lewisburg, West Virginia, where there is a Greenbrier River Hotel where one room is $5,000 a night. And I could sell arugula for $14 a pound in the early 2000s there. And so I made my living doing practicing permaculture as a homesteader and creating a center for bioregional living there as a demonstration education site in natural building and also starting my program at Yestermorrow. Yestermorrow is a design build school in Vermont where I've been teaching for more than 14 years and really innovating curriculum there. I helped create their sustainable design build certification program. And that program emerged out of our permaculture design program and coupling it with their home design build. So that's a little about who I am, a little that I'm gonna go into here that's worth uh, anchoring geographically. I grew up in Chester County, Pennsylvania, raised Quaker and one of the sites we're going to be looking at is a very important tree crop site that John Hershey, who was a nursery person back in the 20s and 30s, and was a friend of J. Russell Smith's, who wrote one of the seminal texts that uses the term permanent agriculture. And this book is called Tree Crops, written in 1924, J. Russell Smith. He is a professor at Columbia University and the Wharton School of Business. In Tree Crops, what Russell Smith rolls out that will be a major thesis that I'll be presenting today is what does it look like to manage at a broader landscape scale places to have more food crops for animals and people provided by trees, not by annuals? What does it look like if we start to transition much of the staple crop food base away from annuals where we can, where it's viable, not to some exclusionary ideological sense, but simply saying, could we enrich the palate of what a landscape provides that has a harvest that can benefit either livestock that we're wanting to raise on that land or um, people's needs for a multiplicity of uses? You know, Clearly, one of the ones that we're hearing a lot about is the capacity for chestnuts to be uh, substitute for flour. One of the beautiful aspects of it is it's also gluten-free. It's perennial. The Chinese and the European aren't susceptible to the blight. They bear predictably every single year. One of, so three of us have started the Permaculture Living Lands Trust. And it is myself, Andrew Faust, 20 years as a permaculture educator and designer in the Northeast, David Harper, 30 years in the conservation and land trust community, lead consultant for much of Agrarian Trust's work, and has worked on many important projects in the area for the BIPOC LGBTQ land access needs that exist in the farming sector. And that's Agrarian Trust, David Harper, 30 years conservation land trust. And the third person who is part of our core team co-founder is Lisa DePiano. And Lisa is a professor at University of Massachusetts doing trials and tests in silvopasture with sheep and chestnuts on the University of Massachusetts campus. And so she's an important component for you to know is the three faces of the Permaculture Living Lands Trust. It's me, Andrew Faust, David Harper, and Lisa DePiano. And why we have come together to create this 501c3 that is specifically geared towards applying the goal of bringing more trees into the landscape diversity of uses, as I started to outline, that are protected with the strength of the Conservation Land Trust structure 
So what we're looking at is we're saying as designers, what are the opportunities to create a real inheritance and a more long-term resilience in the present and in the future with being an advocacy group for more propagation and proliferation of really highly valuable and unique genetics in terms of trees and having those be protected in perpetuity and not be held hostage to the slings and arrows of the marketplace, which is what has brought to our light the need for this, which are the John Hershey trees around the Quaker Meeting House where I attended as a child growing up, but I had no idea that the whole property was planted with the diversity of grafted nut trees that were over 70 years old. And some of which are getting cut down to expand parking lots on the corner lot adjacent to the meeting house because John Hershey planted out 50 acres all around that Quaker meeting house in persimmons, in chestnuts, in hickories that have been combined with pecan. Sadly, one of the hickans that was getting particularly large pecans on it was cut down to expand a parking lot for a development that went in across the street. And it was from the observation of what was happening to the Hershey trees. That is part of the origin story of why we created the Permaculture Living Lands Trust is we don't want to continue to see that happen. We don't want to continue to see 70, 100-year-old, diverse, uniquely grafted nut trees destroyed for insubstantial reasons. Right? So that's, that's a little setup for you on them. what I'm going to get into here with uh, a lot of examples of what what does this look like right at a at a practical scale um how do we design resilience what's the perspective right so i think it's important to start from the broad planetary viewpoint to understand what does resilience even look like right it's easy to kind of pull various key terms out of a hat and then start to rally around them without can we define our terms right so starting with that to understand that we're on a planet that is a very dynamic planet, to understand that water is something that we have a very precious small amount of, literally 3%, 1% available. To understand that the ocean already gives us all the information we need about what good design looks like. That's why life stayed there for 4 billion years on a planet that's 4.5 billion years old, because the ocean is the ultimate solution for a hospitable environment for life to thrive and prosper in. It gives us all the information we need as designers. Arguably the most resilient, abundant ecosystem on the planet, takes up 70% of it. Life stays there for the bulk of evolutionary time on the earth. What is it telling us? It's telling us that life doesn't like it when things vacillate a lot in terms of temperature. Why is the ocean the place that life stays for 4 billion years? Because when the sun comes up, and you're on a rock in outer space getting blasted by a thermonuclear furnace 113 million miles away, it's nice to have a blanket on. And then when the sun goes down and you're exposed to the freezing cold of outer space, how cold? Negative 275 degrees Fahrenheit. You're exposed to that every 12 hours. Well, it's nice to have a blanket on. So it turns out the message that the earth is telling us as biological organisms to continue to have a comfortable ride in outer space as we rocket around the sun, which is the purpose of good design, is to mimic the conditions that the ocean creates. How do we mimic those? We mimic those by moderating the vacillation of variation in availability of primary needs. Temperature, water, food, all add up to comfort. The degree to which we moderate temperature, the degree to which we moderate the vacillation of the availability of water, the degree to which we address the need to simply have a comfortable environment where things don't change too dramatically, comes back to a design approach where we use earthworks, buildings, and water systems to decrease the variability of the availability of food, water, energy, shelter. Right? And we want to do that on a master plan watershed regional scale because what permaculture has shown is that it works at a homestead scale. It works at a community scale. Now, let's take it into the next 
sphere of application, which is regional scale watershed scale planning. And so that's something I've been working on for the last decade, doing analysis, creating teams, creating maps, creating information structures to say, what does it look like to scale up the need to become food independent is what I'm gonna focus on today. But I think it's important that we combine food first with energy second. And we begin to say as communities, what does it look like to master plan in a participatory design level for food independence and energy independence? And let's be careful that we don't, as we go for energy, subsume the capacity for food by virtue of maladaptive placement of energy corridors on prime agricultural soils. And this is a very real problem that is happening due to the fact that we have a technocratic society that doesn't think food is more important than electricity. Turns out at the end of the day, it absolutely is. And that is an important critical theory discussion to have an understanding of. The fact that food is actually more important than energy, it is more important empirically measurably that people are fed and nourished than it is that they have electricity. No doubt about that. And what that means is that from a design perspective as collective organisms living in various communities and landscapes, this map highlights the disjunctiveness that can happen in this type of planning approach. Because you see here three watersheds that are within Ulster County. And then you're also looking at a map that shows the complexity of how, first of all, county lines don't have much to do with watershed parameters. Second of all, neither do the municipalities that are subsections within those counties, right? Towns. And these are the realities that organizations that I'm very thankful for their presence of, which is the river keepers work in this area to raise the awareness within the municipalities of the fact that they live in a watershed. And they need to think about zoning, code, and planning that makes sense in terms of water quality. Water analysis, watershed analysis is critical to what I'm sharing with you today about the approach that Permaculture Living Lands Trust takes to the work that we're doing. This is classic approach in the conservation community, in the watershed community. It is, however, less familiar to the agricultural community and to the farming and gardening community. Typically, we find these to be slightly siloed communities. Ecological restoration, conservation often is not working in tandem with organic farming and local food production. And part of what we're wanting to do is bring together these two sectors so that we can grow greater capacity within both of them by increasing ecological health while increasing the amount of harvest that can be accrued from the landscape. And we want to transition from a way of farming that is uh, very extractive and high impact, moving towards ecological intensification. We need to address the fact that 90% of our food comes from outside of where we live. Moving farming away from a groundwater contamination legacy. Being sure that we're not doing things in a way that continues to create sacrifice zones throughout our country and sacrifice communities. Realizing that the direction out of digging a hole is to first of all, stop digging. Recognizing that we've got a real water quality pollution legacy that actually has been getting sadly worse over the last several decades, not better, as has our apathy at a uh, legislative level in actually enforcing what rudimentary environmental laws we have. We wanna adapt agriculture to pay attention to topography and water, much like was done with the soil conservation initiatives throughout this country, with much of the work that's done today by Natural Resources Conservation Service and the USDA, collaborating with them. Previously, 
was an independent agency. The Soil Conservation Service was key part of the New Deal and is part of the level of human energy we want to be bringing back into the United States with the people who are prepared to do the work. Trees are still the best solar collectors on the planet. And especially when we integrate them with livestock and with um, well thought out systems. What we're looking at here is Kimberton Hills Camp Hill Village, a 425 acre biodynamic farm. And this is where I learned biodynamic orchard keeping. I volunteered here one day a week for five years with my high school students. And we came, we worked with villagers and we worked in the orchard. We built the shed that's on the right-hand side with the green metal roof so that there would be rainwater catchment for the heritage breed sheep that are grazed in the orchard, which is a combination of heirloom pears, heirloom apples, and heirloom peaches, which also have a heritage breed dairy herd that is biodynamically raised, rotationally grazed through the orchard. This is an example of a polyculture perennial ecosystem that increases yields by, in effect, mimicking the layout of wild ecosystems. We've got forest with the fruit trees, we have animals with the heritage breed sheep, cattle, and chickens, which are rotationally grazed through the orchard, which is planted specifically in an arrangement where it is very easy to manage the animals moving through it with the structure providing them with water for drinking in a remote site where you don't need to drill a well. Are folks seeing this? Is that changing for you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Cool. cool. Thank you. So this is another piece of the puzzle. What I'm going to dive into here, I, I'm hoping that made sense, the outline of how these different elements fit together. Um, I, I understand, having studied and worked in biodynamic operations, in part because of a deep respect for the methods and also because I saw the need for permaculture to be informed by biodynamics. And that's something that I started integrating into my lexicon, so to speak, starting back as early as 1994 and was taking students there all the way up into 2001. And specifically, biodynamics has some ingenious approaches to really high quality, beyond organic ways to have excellent looking fruit coming out of an orchard. And that was why I focused on volunteering in the orchard. And what I saw was something that is definitely very time, labor, and management intensive. Let me say with that in mind that we actually do have time, we actually do have labor, and it actually is showing a greater respect of human intelligence when the way in which we are working as gardeners, growers, and farmers um, requires a higher degree of management aptitude. Bringing woodies into the landscape in a way that is informed by other cultures that hit ecological bottom long ago, i.e. Europe, right? European continent, clear cut by 400 AD, decimating forests with the early rise of the coal industry and industrialization. But pre-coal, much of Europe was managed as woodlots for the early stages of industry with coppicing modalities evolving specifically so that they could get a continuous harvest from a planted crop of often hazelnut, often European chestnut that can be used for energy. Then when we combine that with smart home scale and community scale uses of a renewable carbon neutral energy harvest, we get multiple functions from one action, right? We've created an ecosystem. That ecosystem was planted by people, often in places where other crops can't grow very well, that are wet or not perfect for grazing, 
or for vegetables, right? No, when we burn them in something where we get hot water and we can cook with it. Or another way that we can get really smart, stacked, integrated uses of a crop that we've propagated. A propagated woodlot is an entirely different paradigm than high grading wild stands of forest in order to create firewood. Here again, we're going back to Europe to take a cue from how did pre-industrial cultures respond to fuel shortage, right? Coppicing woodlots with masonry wood stoves are another ingenious human adaptation to maximizing the beneficial yields of an intentional woodlot coppicing firewood harvest, right? Here's a house that's been designed to be entirely heated with wood that also uses passive solar design. So by orienting homes to the south with a structure backed up to the north, here's a drawing where we're taking that concept further and some of the latest materials I'm generating for a book that I'm working on on this exact topic, which is what does a bioregional economy look like, right? So here what you're looking at is a passive solar house with a pond with a coppicing woodlot, with a nut grove hedgerow on the north side. And what this does is it maximizes the comfort of the home space and optimizes the way in which you've cut down on the need to even use any energy to keep your home space warm in the wintertime or to keep your home space cool in the summertime. All of these layout features work beautifully for both ends of the spectrum season-wise, right? Andrew, we have two questions in the chat. Um, first one is, what is the land area that the land trust is willing to come to? Uh, all of New York State, question mark. Mm. Um, I mean, honestly, the entire country, our focus, because we're a federally certified 501c3, our focus is not so much size as it is the nature of the activity on the site. We're looking to help projects that have some dimension of permaculture plantings or infrastructure or programming that they're wanting to create on that site. In other words, we're much more nimble and adaptable to small sites when there's some kind of interesting uh, partnership that the client is proposing. And we work throughout the country. Uh, the first easement we're holding actually right now is in Minneapolis on Lily Springs, which is a uh, BIPOC gifted property that is a decolonizing conservation easement that American Farmland Trust was too um, uncomfortable with how radical the language was. And so they decided they wanted to work with us to be the first easement that we're holding. And that is in Minneapolis due to the fact that David Harper was already doing work out that way for a range of clients that he works with as a consultant on legacy planning. Uh, the more recent projects we're working on to give folks a sense of it, even 20 acre properties in New Jersey that have old hickory trees on them that have been grafted or developed by old timers who might not have any children, we're reaching out to people like that and saying, hey, would you like to talk to us? Could we help you protect and preserve what you've created there? Thank you. Next question yeah. is from Megan. They ask, let me ask the obvious question, what is coppice? Oh yeah, <laughs> thank you. So coppicing, a friend of mine just wrote a book on this, uh, Mark Krawcheck. Coppicing is what you're seeing here. It's basically, to get into a little bit of the botany of it, interestingly, think of it as a response that woody plants, meaning non-herbaceous, any plant that gets lingons in its stems is called a woody in horticulture, right? Woodies have responded for millennia to browse pressure from groundhogs, from what, beavers, right, from deer. Coppicing is an innate biological response to this tendency of wildlife to basically just chow down on new growth from a tree. But what the tree does is this thing called epicormic sprouting, which means it shoots off tons of buds in response to that. And they grow up into sort of a what I call a crazy hairdo of new growth. That, it turns out, there's a time spectrum with plants like hazelnut and chestnut, where the first 5, 10, 20 years, 
they're putting on lots more biomass than 30 to 50 years. And there's a sweet spot in that, just like, it's interesting how similar this is to rotational grazing with grasses, right? Where there's a sweet spot where you wanna browse down the grass to with your livestock and then allow it to bump back. And if you take it too far, it doesn't kick back up. And if you let it get too long, it doesn't have prime nutritional characteristics, right? Coppicing is the same thing, but in woodies where they've responded to this animal pressure. And there's this prime time where if you just cut down all of those stems, it'll grow them all back again. There are woodlots that have been continuously harvested on 10 and 20 year rotations with patch cuts. Imagine in your, I don't have an example of it right here because I could do a whole talk just on coppicing, right? Imagine a patch cut in a 20 acre lot. You patch cut one acre. You get back to that one acre 20 years later, it's now ready for you to cut it again. And so they've been continuously harvesting 20 acre, 100 acre coppicing woodlots that were planted by people 500 years ago throughout England. All kinds of these that are still just cranking out woody biomass that people harvest. Mainly they're harvested for charcoal, but they cost, they also are used for firewood. And especially they're part of masonry stoves because masonry stoves, you actually shouldn't be having to be out there splitting firewood. That's like this whole American rugged homesteader concept in Europe. People have been using coppicing woodlots for most of their firewood for centuries. And the efficiency of that is you don't have to split it. It's only three to five inch diameter wood, right? So then when you're designing your passive solar house to be well situated, the amount of wood you're using is both strategically thought about and cultivated for use in a high efficiency energy system. That's what I'm wanting to, uh, to outline these. These are ways that we want to get farmers excited about the many uses of trees, right? So we're thinking about what are creative practical reasons to advocate for more woodies, especially you'll see I'm focusing a lot on riparian zones and the areas adjacent to rivers and waterways because we have a lot of agreement already um, funding wise and organizationally across many organizations that we need to protect riparian zones, right? So now the question, the opportunity is what can happen there? Well, all kinds of interesting things. Let's talk plant talk about what makes sense to be doing in these riparian buffer zones, right? That's one of the focus areas of permaculture living land stress. Here we're looking at a field and we're saying, all right, let's convert this farm in Pennsylvania to be more of a diversified crop farm while still keeping open meadow and pasture, right? So here it is before cultivation. Here it is after we've come up with a plan for crops. I used their... Uh, their tractors. I did a design and a master plan for the property owners, created a crop list. And a lot of this has to do with uh, bringing in crops that you can turn into added value products. So much of this is for things like kimchi and sauerkraut. According to Cornell, fruit and fresh market farms make considerably more per acre than conventional field crop farms do. This is that same field. So now you can see it's planted out with blueberries, with strawberries, with cut flowers, with asparagus. So leaning towards perennials, but also um, interplanting that tree line in the back, you can see that photo with pecans and grafted varieties of hickories. Rainwater, I find rainwater is vastly underutilized. It's an important piece of the formula for resilience when you start to scale up rainwater catchment on a larger scale, 500 gallon, 1500 gallon, 2000, 5000, you begin to get into a substantial mitigation of flood events in the lower drainages of a watershed. So here we're looking at a design install we did for some clients here in the Hudson Valley. This is a 2700 gallon tank. We laid out all the raised beds to be on contour so that they increase rainwater infiltration and decrease on the need for irrigation. And when you do need to irrigate, here's where it's coming from, which you also mitigated flood impact significantly by diverting the first 2,700 gallons of a rain event and filling your rain tank with it, infiltrating as much of that rain event into the soil as possible, using human scale solutions and local compost, 
These are permanent raised beds where they will now be maintained with hand tools, but installed and implemented with tractors. Teaching people is a key part of this. We need a lot more focus on this. This idea, these things are all right now not being taught. Nobody's teaching about rainwater catchment, gravity fed off grid systems. Nobody's teaching about on contour usage of raised beds to mitigate the need for irrigation. There's very little attention to using machines in a way that cuts down on the continued need to use machines. There's not enough of training people. New York State is ranked number three in the nation for total number of acres that are dedicated to organic growing on certified organic farms. So this is a context that we're looking at as a land trust and saying, well, there's, these are successes we wanna build on. Furthermore, small local organic farms give more to food banks than large monocrop farms. So if we wanna truly help with food security locally, the more local small organic farms are, the more likely we are to have less food insecurity happening. There are many farms that I have a lot of admiration for. This is one of them. This is called Four Winds Farm and Gardener. They are NOFA certified. They create their own NOFA certified compost on site. They are a no-till tractor farm that is also a farm incubator and farm training program. Some really nice examples here. You could do a whole session just on Four Winds and what Jay and Polly Moser have dialed in at their operation over 25 years there. Really a place where I take permaculture students to just sit at the feet of what they're doing and saying, you don't have to reinvent the wheel on this stuff. These folks have dialed in some really important elements that we can replicate on other farm designs that I can't help but stop for a moment in a talk where I'm wanting to focus more on trees and say, Four Winds has so many things that we wanna integrate into more farm systems. The one I wanna pause and really underscore, the passive refrigeration in an earth burned straw bale root cellar is a real highlight of what they had the intelligence to understand that investing in high quality infrastructure that then provides a system service passively, passive refrigeration of all of your produce, he spends no electricity uses no refrigerators, doesn't get into any of that bot nonsense with SIPs panels trying to like zip tie something together to keep produce cool for a CSA pickup, right? Jay did the numbers on this. They figured out this building, which cost them $200,000 to build, paid for itself in five years time. The, the, the wise use of fossil fuel powered machinery to set up systems that are ecologically restorative is unique to the permaculture approach in terms of prioritizing that, right? Here we're looking at a small pocket pond that brings in wildlife, creates irrigation opportunities, creates a microclimate that attracts amphibians, improves biodiversity, and no longer is gonna need the application of some kind of machine to provide all of those benefits. Right? Teaching is a key part of how permaculture living land trust is spreading the knowledge of both land access and these types of farming and gardening and design methods, right? So here I am teaching in Brooklyn. We've been teaching in New York City for over a decade specifically because we see a real need to create beneficial city to country food movement and in the regional movement for water quality. Giving people the skills, training people. We mentor all of our graduates. We're building a base of students who understand the things that we as a land trust are wanting to roll out as a practical application for projects and clients who we're meeting. Right? We have a whole network of people to bring to the table on this, that we take two sites, we bring through classes the skills that enable people to begin to get comfortable with working with trees. Here is a class where we're teaching about a biodynamic tree paste method. Raised beds and intensive annual production are also part of the picture of this adaptive method, right? And again, this recognizing education to a broad spectrum of the population is an important piece of the puzzle of bringing about this broader scale change that we're talking about. 
Here's Lisa DePiano, who I mentioned teaching at our permaculture class in Brooklyn. I also put in these photos to give you a sense of how creative our approach has been with the social networking, meaning that very few people have been actively bringing permaculture education to high density urban environments on the East Coast, right? And specifically talking about what does a beneficial city to country relationship look like and a broader landscape pattern that improves water quality and food security. And really giving people the design skills. It's about designing at a detail level, at a broad level, educational. There is one and only one solution and we have almost no time to try it. We must turn all our resources to repairing the natural world and train all our young people to help. They want to. We need to give them this last chance to create forests, soils, clean waters, clean energies, secure communities, stable regions, and to know how to do it from hands-on experience, Bill Mollison. Right? And that's what we're focusing on and have been focusing on with thousands of graduates. Here we have graduates that are looking at solar thermal hot water. It's an important piece of the puzzle to combine energy with trees, and living landscapes and to recognize that there's retrofit methods that we need to be introducing into our society and into our culture that are under championed and have large potential beneficial impacts right design is a big part of it so here we're taking this is a quick dive into a design we did for 50 some acre property that was simply uh, basically an abandoned old dairy farm and here what you're seeing are different patterns of how we approach the retrofit design to achieve the client's goals. They wanted to continue to farm on this. They wanted to do it on a market scale. And they wanted to see what we could recommend as far as multiple solutions to challenges that different parts of the property had. The upper hand of this image where you can see terms like silvopasture, that is a very steep slope that we were wanting to break up the amount of large open pastures that were on that slope. We wanted to bring in housing for farm labor that is off-grid and provides comfort and a high quality of life in a unique living environment that's powered by rainwater and by sunlight. We kept vegetable production and greenhouses in the places that are level, that have prime agricultural soils that make sense for growing things like potatoes and carrots and corn and squash. And we kept places that are good for pasture and for livestock that are good for pasture and for livestock. So part, a big part of this approach is to then say, can we integrate trees into the edge? So you can see that the border of this site, we put in what's called a forage hedgerow with nuts and fruits. You can also see that where there was an erosion gully that the previous cattle had just been allowed to muck over, we created a riparian buffer zone with a small pond at the head and at the dropout right? Sheds with rainwater catchment. Combining livestock with nut trees and restored ecosystems. I think that sentence is a unique sentence in the world of ecological design, and it's an important one, right? We want to advocate for thinking creatively and appropriately about what types of activities can be happening in riparian buffer restoration ecology projects. Can we make human activities restorative and remember that we are a positive force in the evolution of a place when we are thoughtful about how we're planting out and taking care of these places where we live? Silvo pasture is something that's getting a fair amount of airtime, but still much of what we're seeing happen, the small amount of it is happening through the investor sector who is looking at carbon credits and not so much an advocate of long-term patterns of landscape that will continue to provide benefits for centuries to come and protect river systems and watersheds as well. So when large-scale monoculture agroforestry plantings happen and then simply get clear-cut, they are not such a long-term ecological benefit. So while I'm advocating for silvopasture here, 
I want to clarify that, that what we're thinking of in particular is silvopasture on conservation easement protected land that has the status to continue to give a harvest for centuries. Here we're looking at grafted hickories and pecans in a housing development in central Pennsylvania that could very easily get bulldozed and turned into a two-story colonial tomorrow. Adapting agriculture to make sense to bioregions, bringing production back in and transitioning from a consumer society to more of a producer. Thinking about these city to country connections, green belts, redesigning the Northeastern corridor, broader scale collaborative visions are going to give us greater leverage to achieve a quality of life without needing to be um, self-sufficient homesteaders, but living in communities that are doing creative collaborative things to provide more of what they need. So, so taking the waste of the industrial system, beginning to adapt the industrial system to make sense is part of what this number is informative towards that over a third of all food in the US is wasted. We could, on a little less than two acres, grow all the food for each person for a year round, full diet, omnivores delight. We're gonna look at an example of a study here done by University of New Hampshire that's called, um, it's called uh, Food Vision for Lower New England. And from that study, we're pulling this number and the number comes from other studies as well, which is somewhere between 1.6 and two acres per person is estimated to be more than adequate to provide what in this study, we'll look at a few charts from that's called the uh, Food Vision for Lower New England. They estimate to do what they call the omnivores delight, right? So the omnivores delight has a reasonable amount of all pastured grass fed dairy and beef and other meats in it but nothing that is grain fed and not the amount of portions that are in the average American diet now, which is probably a good idea anyway, but not trying to design for something that would be a hard push like pure vegetarianism, but instead saying, how about if we had a more balanced, reasonable amount of dairy and meat products and we tried to produce it all locally? It turns out with that objective in mind, that can be achieved at as low a number as 1.6 acres per person. So then we can take that number and say, okay, how many acres are in our watershed? So here, what you're looking at is we took the stats for what we found about the Rondout watershed, which is a sub watershed of the Hudson. And we found that that watershed is 719,000 acres of land. And that within that watershed, we've got about 91 to 92,000 people living there. And so that comes out to, a mere 118,000 acres out of that 719,000 acres to provide year round full diet food supply, omnivores delight. So here's some of the analysis we've been doing for this type of approach, where we're doing GIS renderings of the entire watershed. So we can start to say, all right, where are the areas that make sense to have prime food crops, right? Where are the places that make sense for energy systems in this watershed? This is a mock-up we did of what does one of the training hub sites look like for permaculture, retrofit farming for regional food independence, right? So here you're looking at a farm where we've broadened the riparian buffer. We've incorporated a combination of annual field crops with perennial herbs and specialty crops. We have greenhouses, we have a retail space, we have an event space. We have road frontage. Lots of sites are like this. Tons of potential to begin to diversify and integrate perennials with um, highly productive and valuable annuals. Thinking at a broader scale, so beginning to have this approach where we can start to say throughout this entire drainage basin, where are the places that make sense for us to have 
agroforestry, agroecology, rotational grazing of livestock and restored ecosystems, solar panels, wind. Where do the microhydro, where do these all make sense? Recognizing that food demand for high quality food is continuing to go up. In fact, it's estimated that unmet demand could be as high as 860 million. Again, lots of studies showing us that the demand is here. The, the opportunity, the gap is supply. And is the goal to simply supply the present market demand or shall we go a little further and begin to supply for a future diet that is more adaptive to the place where we are. So here we're looking at a page from the Food Vision for Lower New England study done by the University of New Hampshire. Um, there is an entire website and organization that I recommend you visit when you get a chance. They're called foodsolutions.org. Very interesting work. We have some colleagues working with them. Lisa Fernandez is the director. She's a permaculture designer and trainer who's worked with our training programs quite regularly. And here you can see that they're, they're talking about very strategically how much land would need to be cleared within New England to enhance the capacity for them to go more food independent while still not infringing upon the valuable and much needed services of uh, protected, undisturbed natural areas. And it turns out that there's lots of what we would call shared landscapes, meaning places that are already impacted, where a, a greater degree and diversity of production can be integrated. And that's what most of their analysis is looking at. When land devoted to fruits and vegetables in and around cities doubles to 500,000 acres, mostly in Southern New England, stemming the increase in developed land in a world of more expensive food and energy, there would be stronger incentives for compact green development and for dedicating urban green space to small scale food production with intensive gardening and permaculture. So this is just to give you a sense of the thoroughness of the analysis that went into those numbers about 1.6 acres per person, full diet year round food supply. Now I'm, I'm gonna segue here into the key part of what I want to wrap up with, right? I have you till three, is that right? 3.15, yes. 3.15, great. So yeah, folks, thanks for going with me on this roller coaster ride. I'm going to wrap up here with some examples for you explicitly of our latest initiatives that we're excited about. We're looking in particular at how do we create these city to country connections and where can they happen more along rivers and streams, right? And here we want to advocate for bike trails, rail trails, places where we could have grafted hickory nuts growing along the pathway, right? Um, here is a tri-grafted heart nut in a parking lot in Pennsylvania. This is a John Hershey tree. These are three varieties of heart nut on a single trunk. And just as a side note, this tree could be chainsawed down tomorrow by a landscaping crew and nobody would be any the wiser or able to prevent it. Heart nut is a very tasty, easy to crack Japanese walnut that is not susceptible to blight. What you're seeing behind my hand in this photo is the graft on a heart nut that is over 80 years old. Here's a rough draft I wanted to share with you of how this thinking can start to be applied at a landscape scale, what I've done here is a mock-up of what it looks like on the left-hand side of a stream to do revegetation with a combination of native ecology genetics and selected varieties of nut trees and persimmons and heart nuts. On the right-hand side, what I focused on is what could be happening on a farm field side. So what we're looking at is a river corridor where on one hand, we've got a rail trail. On the other hand, we have an old farm field that was coming up to the edge of the river. And what I'm proposing here is what the Permaculture Living Lands Trust is advocating for when we think of a more diverse and a wider extension 
to a riparian buffer food forest ecology? What could that look like? What does it look like on the rail trail side where we may have intact forest ecology that we're interplanting? And what does it look like on the farm field side where we may be expanding into what was an annual field crop of some sort? So these are what we would call regenerative agroforestry riparian buffer corridors, right? As I said, we're thinking about what's the plant palette on the farm field side? What's the palette on the rail trail side? So you can see on the farm field side, we've got the coppicing wood lot with hazelnuts that could also be used for firewood and bas basket materials. We have black locusts. Those are gonna be folded into a landscape where people can access them and harvest them. Whereas not so much on the rail trail side, we're not planting black locusts so much. We're not planting a coppicing woodlot, but there we are focusing more on things like pawpaws and persimmons and more natives like swamp white oak interplanted with edibles at a low story along the trail like Nanking cherry. So imagine you're riding your bike and you're harvesting from, here's another planting drawing that we generated to give you a sense of what does it look like to take, this was a drawing of all natives from a book that I liked that showed a side view of what does a field forest ecology look like as it transitions from a field into a forest. And what we did was we took that rendering, re-rendered it and drew in species that were more multifunctional along with natives. So it's an interplanted, field forest ecology with human tipping towards things like hazelnuts, june berries, Korean nut pine, and hickory nuts that are selected for eating. Again, broad scale landscape pattern. Ecopolis is a concept from a book called Regenerative Cities that I like to pull in here, where we're thinking about these beneficial relationships at a broader landscape scale. How bike trails, how stream corridors create places where we can be harvesting nuts and berries and creating a new economy that has robust capacity to provide for most of our needs. Here's a concept that we've begun to really flesh out, which is what does it look like to scale up what in permaculture are called the zones of use and use them to think at a broader regional scale of farming choices and crop choices. So here what you're showing is a mock-up that we're um, further editing as it goes into our book, but it's pretty well rendered here to give you a sense of it, which is that you know, zone one is going to be more a place where we have um, annuals that are harvested regularly. It's more like what we would call our kitchen garden, right? And as we get out into zone two and to the burbs, we get more into some of the field crops, things that take a little more space to grow, like corn, beans, and squash, and potatoes. We're probably not going to do a lot of potatoes and rooftop gardening, correct? Right? So in zone three, we get into things like nurseries and tree crops and niche market dairy. And four can be larger woodlot, larger animal husbandry operations. And five is wilderness and is places where some foraging can be going on. And we wanna create cities that people wanna live in and not run away from per se. And this, this is what this scales up to. So as we think about how each region We'll have unique crops, unique building systems and energy systems that are designed and engineered to make sense for that geography. So here we're looking at a Nature Conservancy map of where we are in the Northeast. You're seeing highlighted in orange the Shaolin Gunk Mountains, which the Center for Bioregional Living is at the foot of on the western side of the ridgeline. And that ridgeline is a very unique ecosystem because it's one of the oldest mountain ridges in the Appalachian Range, about 350 million years old, and it's all been protected. And so what Permaculture Living Land Trust is looking at the strength of how organizations like the Nature Conservancy and Open Space Institute have been able to leverage millions and hundreds of millions of dollars 
to protect really important, intact, highly valuable natural areas and to take that sophistication to now begin to protect places that we plant out as future biodiverse, multifunctional, food providing and energy providing natural areas. We wanna create diversity of green jobs, honor and remember our ancestors, learn from the earth, how does the earth work and appreciate the planetary scale of what we're working with and designing for what we call our cosmic inheritance, meaning having a deep sense of time to create food independence for communities that is a commons that future generations will have access to what it is they need without needing to have access to commodities. So thanks for listening. That's Permaculture Living Lands Trust creating food commons of tomorrow with forest ecologies today. Questions, comments, thoughts, feedback? Thank you, Andrew, for the presentation. Yeah, if everyone, if everyone, if anyone has any questions, please ask them. I'm going to drop a link to the uh, website in the chat so everyone can check out your great work. Oh, thank you. Great presentation. I'm really excited to see the work you're doing uh, applying permaculture to regional development. Um, so really, I'm very glad I sh I came today. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. I, I, one question I have for you is, uh, when you say food independence, are you meaning complete self-sufficiency or do you see, is it more self-reliance? And I ask that only because the my understanding of resilience is, and also actually food um, production in the Northeast is that it's there there may be some danger in trying to that there may be some cost maybe it's a better way to put it not danger in trying to be food independent and i'm just wondering what where's y'all what is y'all thinking about the difference between ind food independence su sustainable or i'm sorry self sufficiency and self and uh resilient i'm sorry let me try that again um, I have, <laughs> okay. I'm fizzing. This is, no, this no is problem. actually, this is a good sign. You have my brain fizzing and that's a, <laughs> that means you've really oh, got take me your thinking. time. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. So what I'm trying, I think you probably already know where I've headed, but it's, um, you know, can we really be self-sufficient? Is it more that the aim is to be self-reliant and then you've been using independent, I think mm. food independence. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just mm -hmm. curious about Talk more about that. Sure. Uh, it's a great question. I do, to start out with the qualifier, I always make a point with the phrase that I'm using of saying um, I'm advocating being more regionally self-reliant, not 100%. I think purposefully to address some of what you might be getting at there, which is I, I don't think that from a design goal viewpoint, trying to be 100% is something that we should be front loading our expectations with. I've always, when I have more time to get into these nuances, I, it's very important to realize that we should take slow and steady steps towards this type of objective. And that it's gonna be something that we're gonna learn upon the way, what makes sense to be growing where and to what degree can we go more self-sufficient or independent? However, not making that some sort of like driving just fire that we have to get to 100%, but simply saying that right now we're at 90% coming from somewhere else. How about if we start to get it to where it's like 70% comes from somewhere else? How about if we get to 30% comes from somewhere else? But the goals would be, and actually this has been a struggle. It's a great question because it gets at the heart of it, which is I think on two levels, it's important to have the humility to say, I don't know what the full capacity would be, but the reason I like entering it in as a framing for the conversation is to say, let's aspire for something that seems potentially unachievable, but let's be appropriate and realistic about it, right? Like, and, and knowing that in the present system, we're already so behind the eight ball, so to speak, in terms of 
a greater degree of food security locally. We're already very dependent on a lot of trucking and transportation to be feeding us. It seems like unavoidably a good idea to have less dependency on those trucking and supply lines. So I think it's a very important question. And, and my approach to it is to say, let's be reasonable, let's be appropriate, but let's begin to go for it at a more gregarious level than we might right now be inclined to do if we just let the market drive what we're doing. That's part of what I'm getting at too, is like, let's think beyond what the market supports. That's important to know. And let's also think about, well, what's our, what's our vision? And what I've been surprised about is how gregarious this food vision for Lower New England is, where they, they're they internally debating, Lisa talks about, Fernandez, about this challenge they have internally of how, how gregarious to go after what percentage. Should we be saying 70 by 2030, for instance? Right. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. From a resilience perspective, uh, self-reliance is the appropriate a target mm -hmm. and there, there's lots of good thinking about why it why it is that's really what we're going for mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and an important piece to me right now with the kind of work you're doing is exactly what you you mentioned which is if you make a, if you make self-sufficiency or independent food independence a design goal that really shifts the problem in a way mm -hmm. that I don't I don't think is actually uh, cultivating resilience in the food system. Mm -hmm. So pretty important to have a clear idea about about that goal and how to relate yeah. to it. It sounds like your idea of you know shifting into it and just seeing what's possible is certainly another approach. That's mm -hmm. that's bet that's better than creating this goal of independence. Yeah. No, I like the word independence, honestly, more from a rhetorical viewpoint. I simply see it as a term that can bring in people from different backgrounds that might not relate to, say, foodie objectives. It might be a little bit more, um, you know, safety oriented and security oriented. So there are interesting terms that I'm, I want to acknowledge. I'm somewhat creatively working with them. I'm not like, using them as, as like hard and fast definitions. Thanks for that question. Other other folks, other questions there? I saw um, Asha Laji. Uh, yeah, this conversation is great and it's made me think that the community side of what you're talking about is connecting with the planning departments and the zoning departments and Absolutely. those levels of government that yeah you know, address, uh, you know, pressure of uh, people building residences and things like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. Yep. 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 Yeah. I, I think you hit it right on the head. One of the things that David Harper has a lot of background in is what's called conservation planning, conservation developments. Um, you know, we get into that sticky area of being not against growth, but saying, how about if we, one of the terms we use is hooking the um, cart of conservation onto the engine of development, you know, and that comes from our roots in Chester County, where we saw open space initiatives, putting millions of dollars into buying up open space that could then be protected in perpetuity. And we're thinking, you know, that type of model where you create tax line items that actually have local constituencies being able to decide about where development happens, how development happens, what stays green space, that those green space initiatives could be segued into community farms that are actually funded and financed through local tax line incentives on green space that's been purchased and protected by the town, right? So we're really keen on that idea of bringing these ideas to municipalities and having the presentations with GIS and other data sets that make it so it's legit in the engineering world. You know, we're, we're, we're pretty familiar with the world of planning and I appreciate that question because it's a really important field that we're taking, you know, that we're taking quite seriously as far as what is the objective of this material that we're putting together, right? Who do we see as our audience for this type of scale of planning and thinking?
other thoughts that folks have or feedback, comments, anything? Well, great, stay in touch. If this uh, piqued your curiosity or interest, um, I'm easily contacted through my website. You'll see I've got an email right there and I think Alexander put the website in the chat for folks. Yeah? Yes, and yep. Yeah, we're very, we're very, as I said, the term David's using a lot is nimble. And I think it's a great adjective to describe our approach. We're really right now young and wet behind the ears as a land trust and just asking a lot of questions and saying, how can we build trust and build relationships and build capacity amongst a lot of people who we have respect and appreciation for who've been doing such important work in this field um, for quite some time. So really appreciate you all taking the time to come and listen to this talk and to um, encourage you to stay in touch to continue the conversation. Thank you, Andrew, for the presentation and the um, information you've shared today. I've put a link to a survey monkey in the chat. If everyone could fill that out, we use those uh, that survey data to inform our future educational events. Like if you like learning about us all about this topic today, please say something like that and uh, we can keep the uh, keep the ball rolling in the future. Yeah. So again, thank you yeah. for coming. Thank you for coming to the winter conference and looking forward to seeing you at the other sessions today. Yeah, okay. one last thing too. I have a I have an online permaculture certification starting uh, February 11th. So check it out. And if folks want to write me, we have payment plans, very flexible. So jump on in on our design certification course if you can. Great range of teachers. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, folks. All right. Have a good rest of your conference and thanks for the event. Thank you. Thank you.